I keep a close watch on this heart of mine I keep my eyes wide open all the time I keep the ends out for the tie that binds Because you're mine I walk the line Car Guy Radio Show. I say this calls for action, and now, nip it in the bud. Nip it in the bud. You got to nip it in the bud. Loving the free and being a spirit. Of hugging a tree when you get near it. Digging the snow and the rain and the bright sunshine. Well, you could <laughs> you could probably tell from that intro. We're talking about lines today. Like, what's your line? Uh, you might remember a famous show along those lines. <laughs> but I love that that line from Tommy James and the Shondells. Hugging a tree when you get near it. You're going to see what that has to do with dragging a line today. And because you're mine, <laughs> I walk the line. Of course, you got to have that Johnny Cash voice in order to get down there. But lines... They're just a big part of life. So on today's lineup, <laughs> I know you liked that, didn't you, Bill? Assembly lines, right? There's one kind of line that has everything to do with the car business. Ford's industrial game changer for this country. What really happened? How did he come up with that? And we're going to talk a lot about assembly lines on today's show. Ancestral lines, right? Family lines. Who's your daddy? Yeah, you knew we were going to go there, too. But, Bill, what's your line? Well, you know, you, you sprung our topic on me a little bit late, so I've <laughs> just treading water some, but I enjoy once a week going down to either the jail or the prison, and I usually have a different group each time I go. And one story I always love to share is I talk to him about Ford and his development of the assembly line. And I like to talk to the guys about, you know, a lot of people think Ford was famous for inventing the car, so he's not really the inventor of the car. He was a, a designer. He was a bicycle repairman and a bicycle inventor to begin with. And he found a way to allow a lot of people to build a whole lot more bicycles fast instead of five really smart people working on one. So I want to talk a little bit about, um, about the assembly line and standing in line when it comes to Ford. Yeah, and also how that relates to somebody. You, you know, you're sharing that wisdom with people that are incarcerated. And, you know, so that's kind of a, a pretty good line. <laughs> well, one is and one isn't. <laughs> no, no, no. I, it, it, You know, it's an interesting thing that blessed are the poor in spirit. Uh, that I, I've always thought, I truly do, that some of the people that are incarcerated – uh, are in a lot better shape than some of us that aren't <laughs> because, well, the poor in spirit idea that, that, that they know that, you know, we got to, we got to grab onto daddy and we're going to get into that a little bit, but maybe you got a great line that you want to share with us. Of course, this is a live show today. You have any question, comment, something we can help you with, you know, Bill's an insurance agent, a, a, again, our Christian insurance guy. So you got a question along those lines, you call us 866 348 Seven eight eight four. Maybe you have a comment about Henry Ford's assembly line, which he gets credit for inventing that, but I would take issue with him actually inventing that. We'll, we're going to talk about that a lot. It's kind of interesting what all it did accomplish. And so we're going to go there. We're certainly going to take it down to what's God's line. And it's going to be really cool, I think, where we end up with that. But as always, we're gonna, you can find all this at our website, Christian Carguy. Dot com. Of course, the car show calendar is up there now for July. Hundreds of car shows um, that are listed there. If you'd like to go attend those kind of things, of course, podcasts for previous show shows, including Christian Car Guy Theaters, Jailhouse Justice that we had here a couple weeks ago, and the Jesus Labor Love. That's our ministry for single moms, widows, families in crisis, as it says in James one twenty seven. 
pure and genuine religion in the sight of God means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. So with the Jesus of Labor of Love, we, every week we have applications come in from across the country of people that are in some type of crisis, usually single moms. We often have widows, definitely had some widows this week. And I want to give you an update on one sort of unusual situation and and give you a chance to pray along those lines for people that are out there struggling um, in their line. And, and you know, those things are, are coming up. So getting on to Henry, <laughs> you know, and, and I know that Bill has some application to this, and I, I think there's application to all this in all our lives. But as you said, Henry was a bicycle manufacturer, but he was actually a, a, a genius of an engineer. And if you were to actually look into a Model N, which was what the car was before the Model T, and, and see what the Model T, how it actually worked, and some of the things which are bear no resemblance whatsoever to cars of today, even the way you drove it was not even close. You, you, you know, there was no gas pedal. <laughs> you didn't start it by turning a key, that's for sure. You know, you turned a crank. The steering wheel wasn't a wheel, was it? <laughs> it was, it was <laughs> kind of a steering wheel, but there, there was a lot of different things that were involved in, in driving or maintaining a Model T. So, he, you know, it was just a, a really different thing. But when he uh, began the manufacturing of these Model Ns and the earlier Model Fords, it took literally 12 hours for them to assemble a car. And there were 3,000 parts, essentially, you know, to round it up a little bit. There were 3,000 parts that needed to be assembled. And so it, it took a great deal of time and 12 hours. And, of course, Henry wanted to, as, as you bring out to your inmates, he wanted to get the price down so that more Americans could afford to drive these cars. And he wanted to be able to build them quicker and, and thus be able to sell more of them to where, you know, you could keep a business running and, and, and pay your employees, which was another big goal of his. Run and, the competition out of town too. Right, right. So he actually took his head of production, another engineer type guy like himself, and he sent him off to go discover what other companies were doing. And fascinatingly, I find it absolutely fascinating. One of the genius is of the assembly plant was he found in Chicago meatpacking plants of Swift. And there they didn't assemble, but they disassembled. <laughs> they, they were literally had people at stations along a conveyor that were taking pieces off of a carcass to create sort of a disassembly line. And it was that that gave the brainchild of, of his engineer buddy. And so really it might be more accurate. And I think that historically it could be said that, that Henry was more the caretaker of the assembly line, more the sponsor of the assembly line, more the person who paid for it to be developed. But the idea came back with that engineer who came back to his production and they began to lay out what was 86 stations along a line. And they went from assembly, essentially a what took 12 hours to build a car to now they were producing a Ford every three minutes. And all these people were again, 86 places along this line, assembling 3000 parts. And again, once they began to produce cars in those numbers, obviously one thing you got to have bill is you got to have at least 86 people, you know, really in, in, in enlarging the force that was building these cars, but those people were um, highly trained. And it has to do with they all are following a very specific instruction on what it is that they're supposed to do, right? And they're, what they do, the next person counts on greatly, and what came before them mattered tremendously. Right. And, and the neat thing, and, the, and uh, to me, the genius of it, was that everybody was on the same page of exactly what it is I'm supposed to do and when I am supposed to do it and what my outcome is supposed to look like. And wouldn't it be nice in your job today? <laughs> I don't know what you do for a living, but, you know, it's just it's really hard to get employees or even myself on the same page with the head of the company is this is what the expectation is and 
what does that look like specifically? When does it happen and how does it happen? And all those things, you know, essentially were structured into Ford's assembly line. And the result of it was that it wasn't take it didn't take long. Anybody who didn't develop develop assembly lines wasn't manufacturing cars within ten years of that, in the introduction of the Ford. But it literally created all those jobs in Detroit, which created all the jobs in the steel mills, which created, you know, jobs for finance people, car dealers, you know, the number of people that became employed as a result of what happened, you know, changed the world gigantically. And so if we could get people on the same page, wow, what a concept. So we're going to go somewhere along those lines. Bill's going to share what happens in the in the jail ministry. We're going to share something with the Jesus Labor Love, but we'd love to know your line or your question. 866-348-7884. 866-34-TRUTH. Stay tuned. Dragging the line. What is your line today on the Christian Car Guy Show? And how does that line up with things? We have been talking about Henry Ford's assembly line. Of course, we're going to get to a biblical application of that shortly. But but right now, I'm curious, Bill. You you use this idea of, of, which I should say again, if you have a question along these lines or you have a comment, a question for Bill insurance-wise or about your car, feel free to call us, 866 866- Three four eight seven eight eight four, eight six six three four. Truth. If you're digitally gifted, but Bill, you used this study at the uh, ministry there for the for the people that are incarcerated. What what you, what principle are you trying to get across? Well, I've been doing jail ministry for about fifteen years. I got into it through the Gideons. After I joined the Gideons, they said, uh, we need to let you know we do jail and prison ministry. And I said, how come you didn't tell me that before the check cleared? And they sort of <laughs> took me down there kicking and screaming. And it was absolutely awesome. So for about five years, I went in and just did a, a Bible Bible verse, Bible study. And one day somebody says, yeah, all you Christians come down here and talk to us, but you never really help us. And I sort of <laughs> took a step back and prayed about it. And I had taken a class <clears throat> on goal setting when I started my insurance business. And I decided after some prayerful um, praying on it, the subject, I put together a a program on how to get ready to get out, what you needed to do, how you needed to have your head straight, um, goal setting, changing uh, who you hang hung around with, and put together a program that seemed to go over very well. I've bumped into numerous gentlemen after they got out that um, shared that some of it worked very well for them. So What I try to do is to explain to them, and one of the stories I really like to share is the three guys that are out fly fishing, you like to fish, and they're in the middle, and one of them heads off to the shore, and his buddies are yelling at him, you're scaring the fish, what are you doing? And after he gets his second boot tied, he yells, look out, there's a bear coming. And his buddies yell at him, says, you fool, you can't outrun a bear. He says, I know, but I now outrun you two. I talked to him about who is it you hang around with when you get out. Are you hanging around with people that are going to get both shoes tied before they tell you problems on you? Or are you going to hang around with people who are going to pick you up and carry them with you when you go? And then we talk about the things that you've got to do to get ready when you get out. And one of them is you've got to plan and you've got to think about those big scary things that have you concerned. And we talk about when you talk about them, when you write them down, when you share them, that really big problems seem a whole lot smaller. And one thing that Ford said is no problem so big if you break it apart into small enough pieces. And then we talk about the assembly line, and we talk about how you can break a problem down into small enough pieces that it can be handled. 
and that our lives are that way, that our lives seem like great, big, huge problems. But if you break them down into pieces like finances and support group and housing and uh, health that and insurance and insurance <laughs> um, and financial I care that, that um, you can find people that can help you with certain parts of your problem. And then we talk about the secret to getting help. Um, and this is age old. I tell them about my daughter was in college and she heard a knock on the door after a bunch of sirens went by. And this fella came to the door and he said, now, don't open the door. Just let me tell you what happened. You heard all those fire engines. My apartment burned down and my son and I need a place to stay. Now, tomorrow when the banks open, I'll be fine. But I just need 20 more dollars and I'll have enough for us to have a place to stay. Do you have five bucks? And she couldn't get $10 out of her pocket fast enough, and her roommate wanted to contribute, too. He knew the secret. He knew exactly what he needed. He could explain exactly what he needed. He went to somebody that had exactly what he needed, and they had enough of it to share with him. And what he asked for was the key part that took him over the line, and there was no reason to expect him to come back. And I talk about if you know where you're going— if you're driving down the road and you pull into a convenience store and you say, Robbie, help me, I'm lost. What's Robbie going to ask? Robbie, what are you going to ask? Where are you trying to go? If you don't know where you're trying to go, you can't get any help. And we talk about how you got time sitting there in the jail to do some planning, to do some praying, to figure out what you're going to need and where you're going to go to get it. And if you don't know the answer, you can figure out exactly what it is you need and you can figure out where you can go to get your answers. So that's that's what the lesson plan. Well, and, and it, it fits so well along the lines of where we're going in a couple places because we got the Jesus labor love, which is quite often these folks, in this case, a lady that I want to talk about who got herself in a position where she knew where else to go, so she actually sent me a text at 11.30 <laughs> Tuesday night because we had helped her with her car, and, and she prayed, and God gave her me, I guess. And so I'm going to help share the wealth here. <laughs> and here's the text that she sent me. It says, hello, Mr. Robbie Dillmore. This is her name, and it says, the young lady you assisted with a car. I just want to say thank you. And to God be the glory for your nonprofit organization, which is, by the way, the Jesus Labor Love. I wanted to come to you to ask if you knew any other nonprofit organizations that can assist my family with assistance from my rent. My daughter and I are facing eviction, and I just started a part-time job at Lowe's, and I'm catching up on my bills. My daughter starts kindergarten in a few weeks, and I really need assistance. I've prayed and asked God to order my steps, and I ask for prayer as well as as any organization that you may know that may help me. Thank you, and God bless you. <laughs> and, and I know a little of the backstory is this poor lady was homeless and managed to get out of the homeless shelter with her daughter, you know, get a job for a period of time, and then lost it, and then now she's facing this whole situation again where she honestly, from my standpoint, just needs a little bit of a leg up. Now, I was able to raise... A lot of money over the week. I'll show you what we got left when we come back. We're going to talk about this lady, but we're going to also talk about a little bit of what God has for you on the assembly line <laughs> when we come back. So much more Christian Car Guys show coming up. I keep a close watch on this heart of mine I keep my eyes wide open all the time I keep the ends out for the tie that binds Because you're mine, I walk the line hey, You know, I've been thinking about that song for a few days and it's amazing the wisdom that Johnny Cash has in just a few phrases there that has to do with um, walking a line. Well, he was smart enough. He didn't actually serve any time. He just sang about it and made a lot of money. He did serve some time. Mm. <laughs> he, he had a deep voice, you know. Mm. Yeah. 
So when we left our hero, our, our Jesus labor love, we're, they're, they're listening to the Christian car guys this morning. We're talking about lines, assembly lines. We've been talking a lot about Henry Ford's assembly line. We're going to get into some more lines. Of course, we got a line at the Jesus labor love, which are single moms, widows, families in crisis. We had a chance to see that all the time. And I was sharing this need that I got actually at 1126 when I look at it p.m. on Tuesday night, this lady who was facing eviction, and she's desperately reaching out, trying to find some answers on how she could get this done, praying hard, clearly. And as I told you, I know I'm familiar with her backstory and that she'd been hopeless, homeless, got out of that. You know, she and her daughter had found this apartment, found a job. We got her car going. <laughs> that was big. And then... Um, you know, she lost that job, and then here she was where she was facing eviction again. Now, the great news is, as I began to talk to her, well, how much do you need? Well, it started out she needed 900 and some odd dollars. Well, then she found 300 and some odd dollars. Then she went and talked to the landlord at length, and the landlord took off some late charges, so she got it down to $765. And I went out, and I began to ask and put it on Facebook and pray, and, and the Lord provided 275 more dollars and actually, as of this morning, where we're at is we only need $175 more in order to make her rent but between what she's raised, what I've raised, uh, what the Lord raised, the whole thing, obviously. It, here's the little bit of an issue is that the landlord won't take a partial payment. So I need the other 175 hopefully, by Monday so we can put all the money into her hands. So... I know you may not be in any position, but, you, you know, Bill said if you, you go to somebody with a need, hey, you know, how many people would it take if everybody just gave $5 or $10? You can go to ChristianCarGuy.com right now and you can see Donate. And if you just put Donate there, it'll ask you what for and save for the lady's rent. You know, normally I know it's for car stuff, but here we're just trying to get this lady's rent paid so she can have a a month to go on and work at Lowe's, which by the way, she's getting in a lot of hours at Lowe's because every time I call her, she's at work. So I know that's going on. And I think she's going to, she's going to make her way up. But you got $5, $10, $25. I had some folks on Facebook give me $25 towards it. Whatever it is, if enough people just take a little bit, obviously this lady's rent can be paid, uh, which I know she's been earnestly in prayer and she's been in that place that Bill was talking about where I don't know how to get this problem undone. And so it's interesting how God has put it together a piece at a time. And so along those lines that Bill was talking about, have you ever yourself gotten in so deep you didn't know which way was up? Seriously. And, and Dennis Rayley, excuse me, Dennis Rainey, <laughs> who's with Family Life Today, he recounted this story, and it's actually in Stu Weber's book, The Four Pillars of Man's Heart, is where I read it. And it's about a missionary family that was on furlough, and they had two children, a little boy who was age three and a little girl who was age six. And they'd been blessed with a fabulous lake house and a dock and a boathouse where they could get to stay. And they had a young niece that was over helping them. She was 12 years old, and she was supposed to watch the children outside playing. And, you know, there was a little three-year-old boy, a little six-year-old girl. And the father, like you might imagine fathers, he was tinkering in this boathouse because he found something he could tinker with in there. And while he was tinkering, the little girls lost track of the little boy who saw the shiny aluminum boat down at the dock and thought, well, that would be really fun. So he goes on down to the dock, unbeknownst to the niece and her sister, and he tries to board this little boat, and he falls right between the boat and the dock, and of course it makes a big splash. The niece, who's now sees that the boy's gotten away, lets out a blood curdling scream as she sees this happen. The father comes running out of the boathouse. He dives into the water where, you know, the splash came from. He can still see that, and he's understanding what's happening. And he begins this desperate search for this little boy. Of course, this kind of lake is very, very murky, and he can't see, you know, six inches in front of his eyes, so he has no idea where to find his son. And he's reaching out with everything he has, and he struggles and struggles, but he gets to the point where you can imagine he runs out of breath and he has to come up and he's like, oh man, if I'm out of breath, then I know my little boy's out of breath. And so he's more desperate. He goes back down again. He begins to search frantically, frantically until he runs out of air again, realizing now it's really getting to the point where he could easily lose his son. He's beyond frantic. 
He goes down the third time. He stretches out with all his arms and legs, everything that he possibly can. He finally feels his little son, and for some reason, his son has got a death grip, an absolute death grip on the pier, on the pillar that is holding the dock. And he won't let go. And so somehow or another, he pries the little boy's hands away from the pillar, and, and he brings him up. Fortunately, he wasn't too far gone. He was able to resuscitate him without bringing in an ambulance or anything. So there they are sitting on the bank of this, of this lake house. It takes them about 20 minutes to recompose themselves. And the father looks at the little boy and says, why in the world were you grabbing on to that post? With all, you know, why did you have the death grip on the post? You know, trying to explain that to a three-year-old, I'm glad he was able to do that. But the boy's answer to me is beyond deep. It's beyond, I, I have thought about it ever since I heard it. I, I can't let it go. It's just, it just blows my mind what the little boy's answer was. But it has everything to do with today's topic. He said, I was waiting on you, Dad. I knew you would come. See, here's this person. They're in deeper than they know what to do, and they only find one thing that they can hang on to, right? That's solid. You're underwater, and here's this thing. And he doesn't know what else to do, but the, the wisdom of this, to, to grab onto something so you don't get further away, but at least you're holding on to something solid, and then the faith is what's remarkable to me. The faith is, Daddy, I know you'll come. And so it appears to me, Bill, that one of the things that we can do immediately is just hold on to something that we know is concrete and have faith that Daddy's going to come. Well, in my lesson plan this week, God took me with that in my mind to Romans 8.26. And Romans 8.26 is kind of where my lady with the Jesus labor love found herself, probably where... Um, people in the Bible find in the in the jailhouse find themselves. In Romans eight twenty six is that where you know Paul is describing when you are praying by the Holy Spirit that he <laughs> you know I'll, he is going to make groans that are too deep for words, and so we don't even know how to pray. We don't know which way is up right? We don't, you know, the little boy didn't know how to get up. He, di he didn't know where to go. So at this point in time, he's praying in his little soul and the Holy Spirit's praying for him with words that are too deep because he has no way to understanding what he needs. And how many, how, many, how often, like this time, this week, how many times did I find myself right there? I didn't even know what to pray in certain circumstances. Even in, in this lady's case, I don't know what to pray, but the Holy Spirit's going to give us groans that are too deep for words. So I decided to look up that too deep for words in the Hebrew to see how deep that was. And it took me deeper than I ever thought I would go because there's a negative particle there of the word alpha. That's what that too deep for words means. And so the way that I interpret that as I studied it was this is something before or beyond the beginning which is like eternal, right? I mean, I can't get there. I can't think of something that's before the beginning, but that's eternal. And so when it's too deep for words because it's beyond my understanding. I can't go beyond the beginning, and I understand alpha. So I thought, well, alpha's the beginning of the alphabet. Obviously, we're going on beyond the beginning. Let me go back in Revelations 1 and study the alpha and the omega a little bit, which is you know what my understanding of the alpha came from is from originally thinking about revelation and that's what Jesus said I'm the alpha omega I'm the beginning and the last what I discovered immediately was that Jesus was actually quoting Isaiah or Isaiah was quoting Jesus however that works Isaiah had three different prophecies early in 41 43 44 and 48 actually that you'll find that same phraseology where God is describing himself as the beginning and the last. But this was in Hebrew. And so how now we had a new clue of now, what is the Hebrew meaning of the beginning and the last? And how does that have to do with the line that I'm talking about and dragging a line and finding a line and walking the line and assembly line 
And under the water. Under the water. It's all coming together in the next segment, so stay tuned. So much more coming up. Be still, my soul. The Lord is on thy side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leave to thy God to order and provide in every change he faithful will remain. Be still my soul, thy best, thy heavenly friend through thorny ways leads oh, wow, to that's um, just right. <laughs> that song just speaks my heart, you know, on, on the whole subject of the little boy. That, you know, God's going to order the steps of what's going to go on. You know, you have no idea you're, you're, you're clinging on for dear life. But if you cling on to God's line, if you, if you cling on to the Father and hope like that, he will order just like he ordered, you know, clearly <laughs> what Henry Ford did. He put things in order, and, and if you wait on him, he's going he's gonna to bring all this stuff. And, and I'm so blessed, beyond blessed, by the, the gifts that came in um, during the last segment for the Jesus Labor Love Lady and the prayers along those lines. Um, you know, it's kind of neat with technology that I can see immediately that, that, that people's hearts have been touched, and, and, and you're joining with this lady in in reaching for that need that that needs to so again you know any amount is just really 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 helpful for her and i'm so blessed that that god is going to meet her need as she as she clings on under the water but what i was talking about a minute ago is i tried to figure out this idea of alpha and the beginning and before the beginning and i began to see this line i was like well what does that mean in hebrew because in my mind <clears throat> Jesus and Paul and those people, they thought in Hebrew. They, th these are Hebrew terms. That So when Isaiah was saying it, he was saying it in Hebrew. And so where is that in the Bible? And I can discover some more meaning from looking at those Hebrew terms in Isaiah 41 when he says Roshon, when he says the beginning, he doesn't use the word alpha, he used the word, or used the word Rosh. And so <clears throat> interestingly, you're going to find that word in Genesis Chapter 2, the first time is when God is describing the head of the rivers that split off into four parts that are coming out of the Garden of Eden. So here you got the beginning of the river is called the head of a river. You've probably heard that all your life, mm -hmm. but here's this word again in Hebrew. The next time you're going to find that word mm -hmm. is in Genesis 3 when God curses Satan for having tricked Adam and Eve. And he says, I'm going to put enmity between your seed and her seed and he will crush your rosh. He will crush your alpha. Yeah. He will crush your beginning. He was going to crush your head. And you will crush kind of his omega. You're going to crush behind his heel. Now, if you think about how Satan attacks, he, he, he comes from the back. He nips at the heels. He separates the weak from the, the herd. And, it, and, it, and certainly that was what he did with Judas, right? He, he separated him from the other 12. He was the weakest. He was the one he deceived, and that was Jesus' heel that got crushed. I mean, he clearly was there. But there's a line here that, that I don't want to miss, and the line that, interestingly, God goes on to share in, in Genesis is through Jacob. And Jacob did what? As he was coming out of the womb, he was grabbing his brother's heel. <laughs> and that's why he was named Jacob. He was the heel grabber. He was the supplanter. But later in life, right, he got in the wrestling match with God, and he, like the little boy, he hung on to God for all he didn't have anything else to do, but hang because he was so afraid of his brother that at this point in time, he just hung on to God until God blessed him. And God changed his name. And the way he changed his name, he changed it to Israel, which is instead of contending with the heel, he is now contending with God. He went from contending with the Omega to contending with the Alpha. And, and, and if you check out a little later in the book of Exodus, when God refers to Israel now, he no longer refers to him as his servant Jacob, 
But when he refers to Israel, he refers him to his, as his son. When, when he tells Moses, tell Pharaoh to let my, my firstborn son Israel go. It's a beautiful passage. A- and the point is that when we hold on to God, <laughs> like that little boy under the water, we now get in line with, with the head. Like we now have, we, we are, if, if our soul will, be, soul will be still, he'll begin to give us instructions. Like the lady in the Jesus labor love. Did you hear what she said? He ordered my steps. She said it right in her message to me. He ordered my steps to contact you to see if there was another organization that could help my rent. And through that, God was able to orchestrate these steps of the different people that have already donated um, t- to meet this need. A- and I just know that, you know, she got still, and, and, and that's where it happened. And it's just like your inmates there, Bill, at the, at the jailhouse. You know, one thing we share is that it doesn't say that God teleports you to the valley of darkness. It says he orders <laughs> your steps that you're not promised that, all your problems are going to be solved immediately. But if you wake up in the morning and you say, God, what do you want me to do today? Through the repentance, Jesus said, I came so that repentance and forgiveness of sins would be taught in my name. Once we stand there and we repent, the promise is that God will forgive and forget the transgressions. And then if we listen, he will tell us how to step back, to walk back, to get back to where we're supposed to be. Right, and I, w- I want to go back just for a second to you're so underwater you don't know which way is up, and that's where this little boy was. Now you're talking to a scuba diver. Right, I, I understand. There. You don't know, yeah, and you have been up so underwater, and and so at this point in time, to cling on to that one thing that he knows is solid, and 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 his faith that my dad is going to rescue me. It's it's absolutely incredible, just like Jacob's faith, hanging on to God in this wrestling match. He's hanging on for all he's got because he's got nothing else. And he's saying, I know that you're going to bless me. Tell us about your time you couldn't find a way up. Well, yeah, I was, used to scuba dive a lot. I still scuba dive once a year. And one of the things that you're taught in the rescue dry, diving course is if you get down and you find out your visibility disappears, you've always got to know where your anchor is. So you head to the anchor and you grab hold of that chain and you can go up that line. You know where the line's going to go. Hand over hand, you can make it back up to the boat. But if you get too far from that line and you don't know which is the right direction, you can be down at 90 feet and have absolutely no idea which direction to go back if you can't swim over and find that anchor. Wow. So... I would have thought that just the feeling of your body wanting to float would tell you which direction's up. That doesn't work? Well, you got to be careful there. I went diving with a new diver one time, and we had a discussion about how much experience he had, and he sort of inflated how good a diver he was. And we got down to about 90 feet, and the conditions weren't very great, and he bugged out, and he decided that he was going to go up. And I'd just taken a rescue diver course, and I tried to keep him from going up. And you can't keep somebody from wanting to go up. And one of the worst things you can do is to go up too fast. And the other worst thing you can do is hold your breath as you go up. Well, we popped out of the water about six feet. (laughs) You know, you, you got to come up the right way, and you've got to come up slow, and you've got to come up where you want to come up. Hand over hand on the uh, line. line is a safe way to do it. <laughs> I couldn't have orchestrated this line any better. I had no idea that story was coming, well, See, Bill, the Holy I, Spirit <laughs> comes with me when I show up for and the he, show. He, he groaned with words and said, Robbie, you need Bill to do this with you so you would find out about the line and the anchor. Oh, it's beyond cool. Well, thank you for listening. Oh, thank you so much for praying for my lady with the Jesus labor love for your donations. They bless my soul. And uh, we pray that you would have a wonderful, safe, very uh, not drowning experience over the this, this 4th of July weekend. We pray you slow down. Jesus walked everywhere he went and got it all done in 33 years.